Ryan Blue, Dane St Sundstrom, welcome to the Cube. And just to start off, before we go into backgrounds, affiliations, origin stories, let's start on the topic. We spent 10 years separating storage from compute, pursuing that. That was the modern data stack. What is separating any vendor's compute from data? How is that different? Um, how does that change the data platform? And what what new use cases does that change open up? Dane, why don't you start? <laughs> I thought you were going to start with Ryan. Well, uh, so the the background of like data of separating storage and compute is that we were able, very easily able to like scale the compute independently of the storage, which like leads to a really good uh, uh, ability to kind of change the cost profile. With separating the data out instead of just talking about storage means that we're much better able to interact with other systems. Um, there's been like, there, there's very much this kind of island world. Like Hadoop tried to do that in some ways, um, had a bunch of issues with like incompatibilities of just like how the stuff moved forward. But I think with this, we're finally getting to the point where like you actually see vendors who would never even think about interacting with the outside world in the past, like big traditional databases. Um, you see this with like, uh, actually literally every cloud provider out there is like well we're going to connect to the data lake now and like that all happened in what the past two years like yeah. it's been very quick um and by that just to, to clarify that mean, means any compute engine now talks to this common data foundation and we don't need pipelines moving stuff everywhere correct sometimes the okay. question is whether or not they, they, they decided. So everyone outside of like the, the compute engines like Trino and Hive and Spark, where you end up having, they're kind of built around the idea of like, we're going to connect to whatever we can connect to, right? When you get beyond that and you get into like the cloud databases, they typically pick one slice. So it's like, you can talk to Snowflake if you choose Parquet, of a certain shape, like they're getting better at it. I think Redshift picked two or three formats. So it's like, if you pick those exact things and you do it exactly how they wanna do it, then it works. So what happens when they disagree? You move data. Okay, so in other words, um, it's, it's a journey, just like separating compute from storage and building the modern data stack really took 10 years to mature, may not take a decade, but um, to pull apart different compute engines so that they can talk to common data where we we agree on the metadata we agree even on the on the not just the table format but the you know everyone's going to use parquet underneath the table format that sort of thing that's going to take time and you guys have gotten there first so so all right Ryan elaborate on this from your perspective from from the as the creator of iceberg uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I would say that the separation of compute and storage has ended. I think we're still finding out the ramifications of it because okay. one, you know, like S3, I think is, is a, well, shouldn't say just S3, like cloud object stores are a, a huge driver of all of the change that's going on right now. You have to have a central object store and a central like storage platform in order to have something that even makes sense uh, to talk about separating data um, from compute. Um, and, and so like, I, I think this is just an, an ongoing transformation where we're going further up the stack um, of this decomposition. Um, and it is going to continue for quite some time because uh, at least from, from my vantage point, I think this changes where certain components go in analytic data architecture. And so, you know, we, we, I think uh, I've been talking a lot about centralization and specialization, and we're, we're seeing this fundamental shift where certain components, including data and storage are being centralized where possible, you know, there's a headwind, like Dane was saying, where 
uh, you have to have the compatibility built. So it's a long journey, but also certain things are, are necessarily going to move in that new world. Um, the one I, I always harp on is uh, access controls and governance. No one wants like different access controls depending on the engine that's accessing their data. Okay, we're going to come back to that because that is that is a big issue. So um, let's let's pause for those who you know. I wanted to get one big topic out there that that we're going to spend the show unpacking. So now let's talk about sort of the origin stories for for. Trino and Starburst and how, how you came at this problem where, where you guys did build a compute engine without the data storage. And then Ryan, we'll get to you and you know where Iceberg came from. So Dane, you start. Yeah, so we started at myself, Martin Traverso, uh, David Phillips and Eric Wong. Uh, we started at Facebook. Facebook was, I mean, they wrote Hive and it was great. It was a great way of being able to have uh, less super skilled engineers be able to interact with the massive data sets Facebook had. The problem was it sucked. Like the UI for Hive at Facebook was you submit a query and it sends you an email. It doesn't even give you the option to show you the results. It literally sends you an email saying your query's done. And it might be, an hour later and it's like oh you had a syntax there like it was terrible so we were um we came in there was a, a small group of people that built something at a hackathon that was like it could do sql a bit faster uh but that system kind of hit the end of it so we came in to build a much more powerful distributed system uh using traditional database techniques like that was the revolution we brought was gee, databases, big distributed analytics databases had been being, you know, explored and written for 20 years at the time. You know what we did? We did the traditional thing. We built a normal distributed uh, SQL focused analytic engine, except instead of a completely open programmable platform like Hadoop and Spark. Um, and we're able to get like much bigger uh, scalability and performance, kind of all the stuff you're used to now with uh, modern big systems. The key with Trino is that we were focused on the traditional data lake. And that means we had to support all the terrible existing Hive formats. When Parquet came along, we supported that. When Orc came along, we supported that. When Hive Acid came along, we supported that. When everything comes along, we support it. Eventually, Iceberg comes along and like really, we sat down in a meeting with Ryan at Netflix. He's like, hey, we're building this new thing. And he had solved all of the insanely hard problems you had with uh, Hadoop data sitting in object storage. So, okay, Ryan. Just to clarify this, before <laughs> yeah. Ryan, before we go over to Dane, what was the year you started? And I, the reason I ask is big distributed databases typically take many years to mature. And I don't know if everyone appreciates the fact that like this Trino code base is very mature. Like yeah, it's we been- started 11, 10 and a half years ago now, I think something like that. Uh, so it's and not the- much, not much younger than Snowflake, for instance. Yeah. And, and uh, I, more actually, mature the, than Databricks SQL. Yeah. The Snowflake, uh, when they were, doing their startup, they tried to recruit all of us away to work on Snowflake. So it was actually the very same time they were starting up, we were building Trino. Um, and when we started Trino, um, there's this very famous uh, blog from, uh, uh, anyways, one of the analytic DB guys who's like, yeah, like takes 10 years to build an okay database. I think we beat that by a little bit. We have a pretty darn good database and it took 10 years to like, really get it in and like you know the the key to building good databases is like making the system like it's all the little stuff like workload management and all that stuff like the sql and the distribution it's like the easy part you get that pretty quick then it's the it's the everyday experience that just takes a long time to work through 
So no compression algorithm for experience, especially for databases, file systems, and operating systems. Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about like, you know, you see people talk about these little esoteric things, like you see tons of research papers on them. And it's like, you know what people care about is like, they have the functions they need. Like, it's interactive, like, it hooks up to Power BI, right? That's what end users actually care about. What we computer scientists, etc, care about, like, often, we're very much more concerned about internal details that you know, they make life better and they're fun to talk to your friends about, but they're they're not what really moves. Uh, it's not what's important to the, the people ultimately using the system. <laughs> All right, Ryan, you were half of this story to explain where Iceberg came from and, and then how it fits in now. Yeah, um, so I think the, the primary thing was uh, I, I joined Netflix and Netflix was entirely on S3 as our source of truth. Um, back when no one did that and everyone was like, but don't you need data locality? You know, don't you need to ship the, the compute to wherever the data is stored? Um, and at the time, yeah, you probably did need to be using HDFS because um, we were not, it, the whole code base was not ready to be functioning on an object store. Um, things like, uh, you know, inconsistent listing that is thankfully a thing of the past. Um, you know, we had to worry about read after write consistency and, and all sorts of, um, you know, ugly, ugly edge cases. Um, but, but basically we had the same problems that everyone else did, but 10 times worse. So uh, the, the example is like, if you're trying to rewrite a portion of a hive table, you, you need to replace the files in a directory. And there's no way to do that atomically. So you can either delete all the data first and then write it back and hopefully you hopefully that job succeeds, or you can write all the new data and then try and keep track of what you needed to delete. Like there's not a good way of doing it. And that sort of works if you can do all of those things really, really, really quickly. Um, but every request to S3 was not seven milliseconds it was 70 milliseconds. And so all the things that you had to do really, really, really quickly to make sure your database doesn't lie to you, um, we could no longer do really, really, really quickly. And so we had to solve this problem. We had to actually go and, and look at hive tables and say, you know what, that model of keeping track of what's in our table is too simplistic, right? It, it's not going to work in um, a, a world based on object stores and rethink and do exactly what uh, Dane was talking about. Actually, I'm wearing a shirt today. What if we applied database fundamentals? <laughs> I mean, it's like we stole a whole bunch of stuff from, you know, what databases actually do and, you know, designed for the, the constraints that we were working with. Okay, so now, so let's, let's talk about Dane, just the, the, where you where you brought it brought it back home, which is people just want to connect Power BI or whatever their favorite BI tool is. How how does that work? Um, how does that look for the end user um, if they're combining, you know, Starburst and Iceberg? And and then what does that look like to the uh, you know the the data engineer who's, who's preparing that data to the administrator who might have to you know, configure all this. What's the, yeah. what's the, what's the loss in simplicity and, and then the gain in price performance or some other angle? Well, I, I think that the easiest and quickest thing to talk about is from the end user's perspective, they don't want anything to change for them. Like they need to use their existing tools. Uh, it needs to be easy to set up. Um, the thing that, often doesn't get talked about in databases performance matters like if you switch engines and you have dramatic performance differences you typically have to write different queries so then people have to learn new things um, or if you're using a dumb visualization tool it's not you're just going to have bad performance in some cases so like from the end user like the fact that we're using iceberg or i don't know anything else 
they generally don't know. This is kind of a uh, more of an admin kind of thing um, for your traditional folks who are using a BI tool or doing interactive investigations. Obviously, for someone using Spark, like a data engineer, like details matter to them, like deeply matter. Um, it can be like the data could be effectively unusable to them uh depending on what you did or like they're gonna have to rewrite it all or like a bunch of other things so like normal users like you know it's so, like your normal everyday business user who there might be a thousand of them for each data engineer like i think we were hundreds to one at facebook um like they just want to use the system um, and they would they so so how what difference would they see now is there is it that there's no difference in performance and the difference is cost to the people who are paying for this or or will it be i mean from their perspective the engine's gonna matter like they're gonna be used to us it's like connectivity is one thing language semantics performance matter so like from their perspective like the engine they're using often matters um to some extent it's 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 uh you're, you're getting into like user psychology at that point like i think the for this with like you know me and ryan talking here i think the more interesting part of this is what the administrators are seeing with this so like managing a data lake especially with something like hive has historically been really painful like how do you do data maintenance one, one of the things ryan just talked about is like oh, i want to rewrite a part of a table what if like some job just spit out like really tiny files or let's say uncompressed data and it's like you want to replace it so you build new files how do you atomically swap to the new files without something like with without a modern data format so like pains me to say this but hive acid <laughs> can actually do this even though i we could talk about it but it's terrible and i don't think people use it anymore but, uh, yeah uh, i don't think Abular, it's, it's the yeah. third modern data format that no one recognizes because it came so I, early yeah <laughs> yeah so there's like uh iceberg can do it uh databricks can do it with um the their stuff and i think hoodie does it too not sure um but like something as simple as like i want to recompress the data is virtually impossible up until when did you guys start three years ago was that four years ago uh 27 publicly like an, end of oh, yeah. uh, early 2018 is when we yeah released yeah released the first version yeah yeah and it was basically so, impossible before then this is like so uh background tasks these are the admin administrative tasks for that are that are performance tuning like by compressing the data getting rid of essentially garbage like garbage yeah, collection or that equivalent every database does this right it, it takes yeah. files that it's written and have since changed and it rewrites them in the background um you know to be more performant uh more dense to use different like it, databases generally take care of this but in the hadoop space we we didn't develop those capabilities because it was unsafe to make any change whatsoever to data once it was written like you, okay. you might screw up a quarterly report if you go recompress something. So of course you just deal with it. So, yeah. but, but all right, guys, I want to try and stay away with Hadoop, even though that was part of the origin story. No one's thinking about it today. So more the comparison is with the incumbent data platforms where there's now an alternative like you guys. Um, and the question is, how is it different from people's experience with with their incumbent platforms or how can it how can you complement you know as as people put more of their data in iceberg then they might also be able to bring you know starburst along with it um and and so the question is um first for ryan what what are the sort of use cases that push customers to start putting more of their data in Iceberg from the, say, proprietary formats, or or if they're evaluating, you know, Iceberg versus Delta um, from, from Databricks, and then what would be, where would they bring 
Starburst in after, after Ryan, Dane explained where Starburst would complement what they've got today. What are the use cases where it's got, you know, a special uh, value add, even if it's, even if it's just cost for data engineering, but something like that. So, so Ryan, why don't you explain sort of when, when people should consider iceberg from, from what they're using in with their incumbent data platforms. So the existing data platforms come in, I think two flavors. There's actually the, uh, it, you know, we, we don't use Hadoop anymore, but there's the same code running on top of object stores in the cloud. And those hive tables are still very, very widely used and super dangerous. So like, if you're still using hive tables, move to a modern format, like <laughs> that is okay. really, really critical. Um, okay. And, and, you know, iceberg is a, a great example. Um, one thing that distinguishes the iceberg community from, from uh, others is that we really want uh, everything to be able to interact with that data and to be successful. So I want Starburst uh, and Redshift to both be able to invest money in support for this format. In order to do that, you need a community that's open, uh, a community that really like values everyone's input and like puts everyone on an equal playing field. Um, that is, I think, one of the, the key aspects of Iceberg that, that has led to its adoption. I mean, it's a good format technically, but it's also one that is specifically trying to be the thing that everyone trusts and will, will, uh, will use. And um, so I, I think that that is, is probably the biggest reason to use it. The, I, I skipped over the second, or the, the second um, group in your, your question though, which is um, you know, cloud data warehouses. Um, so you've got everyone using Hive tables, they need to move over as soon as possible. Um, we were really surprised when cloud data warehouses started adding support, because we considered these two worlds to be entirely separate. And I think what people are realizing is that, well, I mean, shared database storage is a new thing. We've never been able to share database storage in an analytic database before reliably. And so like Hive was doing this for years and people loved the flexibility of being able to use Spark and Trino and Flink and you know, graph database alongside one another without copying data without like moving anything and keeping stuff in sync and all of those ugly problems. But it was unsafe and it was slow because you can't fix data. And so once we we unlocked those problems and we actually upgraded, like our whole thing was to upgrade data lake storage to act and perform like data warehouse storage. And once we did that, now the data warehouses are going, oh, hey, well, we can play in that world, get access to a lot more data <laughs> and you know it's easy for workloads to shift we don't have to copy data in you know it's it's a whole lot easier to sell a database if you go oh hey we work with your existing you know data set that is stored in s3 okay um and dane the the question i wanted to ask you building on that is once the data warehouses open up because they want to access all this open data everything that the data warehouse thought it owned is fair game. So of all that open data now that is in open sort of data warehouse storage, as in like Iceberg or Delta or whatever, what are the first things that someone should work, work on with Starburst? So I, uh, my, my, my first thought on what Ryan was saying is that, like, yes, but that isn't really why the data warehouse people showed up, the cloud data warehouse people showed up. They showed up because the data lake people are being very competitive with them on the price sensitive customers. Like the, the cloud data warehouses are extremely expensive. And they're typically islands, which makes anyone who's been around through the Oracle days uh, very nervous. They do not want to get trapped in. Um, and so the cloud data warehouses, I think, are making a play saying like, hey, we can export this data. You can use other things. Um, there's still the language barrier. There's still going to be the performance barrier. They 
perform pretty differently. Um, often the cloud data warehouses are treating this as an export and an import. So even when they, they're like, oh, we're querying it directly, they're not. They're actually importing the data, running a query, dropping the import, or it's a cache or something like that. Um, so like they're, they're there because the market's forcing them to be there. Um, engines like Trino, who, who's like gone through the age of like, we have lots of formats. We're used to dealing with uh, having multiple formats. Our engine adapts to it. We have like, there's different performance aspects, even between like, yeah, you're using Parquet, but the way that Tabular uses Parquet and Delta uses Parquet are very different. You have to do different query planning, et cetera. Like they're kind of different worlds. This is also exactly why the cloud data warehouse is like, they picked like just iceberg like, like snowflake picked iceberg uh some of them pick some of the hadoop formats but largely they're going to pick one and that's because like supporting the multiple that are actually out there in the real world is just way too hard for them to get to and their goal is to like check a box so with trino like this is what we built like we built a system to be open uh that you can migrate uh you can there are other vendors of trino like uh athena uses trino so you can like move your queries around it works like again depends on how the vendors treat their their forks um uh so like we built it to be open um i think it's really powerful as like as either someone starts out really sensitive to the walled garden that um the cloud data warehouses represent, or they realize like, it's just too expensive. Like you typically hit a wall at some point where it's too expensive. Um, or m and like you ask people why they have Postgres and MySQL and DB2 and Oracle and everything else out there is they buy a company, they're using someone, something else, they got to meet in the middle. It's the reality of like big companies. There hasn't been as much m and in the past few years. When that restarts, like data warehouse is gonna see even another big boost as people like figure out like it is the universal way to get data shared between these very proprietary systems. Okay, so well, let me push you one step further on that, yeah. which is um, you're saying even for the incumbents to get to, to sort of first class citizen support for these open data formats, that's, that's a journey. Um, that's so let's hard. say they're they're starting to they're starting to support they're starting to support this. So a customer that's got an incumbent data platform, where can they most usefully apply um, Starburst, you know, as their query engine? What what sort of workloads? Uh, so typically, um, it's a it's a big question. So uh, typically the when when someone's looking at adding another tool they typically have a problem right so the problems are um often cost or something like that so they want to be able to have like really high performance dashboards like lots of data like uh, typically you get into this problem of like there's just too much data to reasonably process the queries are too big and they want to move to a more cost effective solution on that um you hit kind of a volume or said another way i could spend the same amount of money and do multiples the amount of work um, and you often people start off with starburst by just hooking it up and exploring the data in their existing platform because trino supports federation so we can just connect to snowflake you can explore your data you can play with it then when you want to hit optimal performance you export it uh, we recommend you export to uh, Iceberg. It is by far the, of everything out there today, it is the best in terms of data lake formats, in my opinion. Um, and we export it out and we manage it in the, the data lake. Now you have this problem of like, now you have two copies of data. How do you want to manage that? That's a big problem with migrations. Like, and there are, there are different solutions to it, depending on what your requirements are. Um, normally people are 
good enough like exporting like once a day or something like that or they move the source of truth and the question is like is the cloud data warehouse you're using is it performant enough on real lake data or is it doing the import trick okay it depends on the so, engine so what you're saying is some of these engines you might treat them really like a teradata in the cloud for serving you know performance sensitive things like dashboards and then some of the more exploratory work or the the or the production repeatable workloads like like data engineering you might preparing the data for those dashboards you might do outside am so i understanding we're, that right we're typically doing high volume dashboarding so like um, often people will set up fairly staticish dashboards but we get into like slicing and dicing of uh, data through a dashboarding system you need something that can work fairly close to raw data it doesn't require like special indexing or something like that so like we're used in a lot of those situations we're also used in the pipelines like at at to put it in perspective at facebook like we did all the interactive workload we did the dashboarding workload and some major portion of all the pipeline daily data movement cleanup workloads so like we can support all those different ones often we're being used for larger data sets that live in the lake um, the problem with traditional data warehousing cloud data warehousing is that it's so expensive you're often not putting all your data in there you often end up going with a design where you're staging everything to the lake and then you're moving in sub segments into the cloud data warehouse for specific users it's just not economical to put all the data in um, okay and we normally just operate on the original stage data we may process it into like it's often called like you know bronze silver gold data we are often used for some of those processings um uh, but normally people end up coming to the lake first once they get deeper into their data warehousing journey like <laughs> okay so so ryan there's a i want to come back to the these different table formats that are out there now because you've you've you know everyone's we've all heard of delta tables from from databricks we've you know many people have heard of hootie We've talked about iceberg. Um, explain to us the trade-offs for those who are trying to wrap their heads around which to choose. What are the trade-offs? But also, we've heard um, of two two solutions, supposed solutions for interoperability. I think one was X tables, and one was uh, Uniform from from Databricks. And I've heard you say you think this is a bit of a fantasy. So explain both questions, like the, the trade-offs, and then why you really do, why you think you need to commit to one. Yeah, um, so I don't know that I'm saying you need to commit to one. I am saying that translating between them is uh, probably not gonna give you the, the results that you want. So let's, let's start with the first question. Um, so uh, Iceberg has two things that uh, the other formats lack in some respect. Um, one is, uh, a strong technical foundation. Um, like I said, we stole a whole lot of stuff from the database world. Um, so we fixed things like schema evolution. You should just be able to run rename column without either dropping or resurrecting data from, you know, from two years ago or anything like that, right? These things need to be reliable and have well-defined SQL behaviors. Um, there were so many, uh, correctness problems, um, we, we really tried to fix them all. Um, not all the formats did that. And so that is one thing that distinguishes Iceberg. Um, the other is that open community where it, it's uh, owned and controlled by the Apache Software Foundation. Um, you know, I'm a PMC member, but my, my company who, you know, my company is started by the two people that originally created Iceberg at, at Netflix, uh, me and my co-founder, Dan. Um, we don't have a majority of voting rights and the, the project management committee. 
And that's on purpose, right? Like I'm not going to go hire a whole bunch of PMC members because I really want this to be a community where everyone has a say and everyone has, you know, an equal place. And I think that is a very distinguishing thing because it means that, you know, Dane can come in and have influence and, you know, argue in that project. And it's not just one commercial interest saying, no, this is what we're doing. <laughs> are are <laughs> you, know, you saying you that one business on that? Are you saying one commercial interest kind of controls some of the others? I, I'm saying that I, I don't talk about the other formats, but I'm saying that one thing that we wanted for Iceberg was neutrality. Um, and I think it's very important that the community is neutral. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't I'll like say that. <laughs> I, I, there, I mean, let, let's just like, for example, Hive Acid literally is Hortonworks. Like the, there are the other formats, I think have their pretty obvious, very strong control. Um, some of them just because there's no one else there, like there's no one else in Hive anymore. So like Cloudera kind of runs the show. Um, but yeah, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I think the other thing Ryan did that's critically important was one of the very first thing they did was they wrote everything down. There is a spec. You can read the spec. It's pretty good as it comes to specs. Um, there, when some of the other formats came along, they wrote specs, but important commercial advantages were left out of the spec. Okay. Um, so, some like, of the other we, specs are, are quite yes, bad. <laughs> yes. Like we, for the other, we read the the spec, and if the iceberg code doesn't match, we bring it up and we change one of the two. Uh, for the other ones, we just reverse engineer their code base. Like that's just how it works. Um, okay. Sorry, Ryan. I interrupted. No, no, you're 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 right. Like the spec, I think, was important. But that that goes to show, like, we really wanted this project to be something uh, that was a foundational layer in data architecture, and we knew we needed to have a neutral community a spec solve all the problems like we we really built this project to be a a universal data layer and we're very happy that that's exactly what it's become so so all right so let's let's talk about then this universal data layer for for truly to be separate from compute um we have to deal with the issue of security like authentication authorization so i know you guys differ on, on where that belongs. So let's talk about the trade-offs. Dane, where, you know, Starburst has it in the in the compute engine right now. And, and I know there's some good reasons for it to belong there. Let's explain your point of view and then and then let's, you know, hear Ryan uh, as to why it belongs in or could belong in storage. I I mean I think the problem is that there's no good place to put it. Um, there have been attempts like Apache Ranger. Um, there's commercial products like Immuta. Um, there's OPA, which is showing promise. Um, there's not a great place to put it. And it's it's actually, security seems simple on its face. It's like, who has permissions to read to this table? Who has permissions to write to it? And you can do that with file-based security. Like you can go into S3 and you can set your file-based permissions. It's difficult. Um, you could put a proxy in the middle that deals with it. Like you get so much out of it, but security isn't just our back. Security's a back. It's tagged data sets. It's uh, based on where I log in. I have different permissions. If I'm in the you know, corp net, I have certain permissions. If I'm at home, I have different positions. If I'm in, uh, Russia, I have different permissions. Like that happens. So um, what you're saying and, is, it's to, just to be clear, it's it's more than our back being role-based access yeah. control. It's not that it has to be tied to the compute engine. It just needs to be comprehensive. No, it okay. also ends up being tied to the compute engine. It's actually the exact same yeah. problem that Iceberg's trying to address today with how views work. So is common for uh, sophisticated security systems to be like, you can read this table, 
but you can't read rows that match this expression. You can't uh, read these col the columns are masked with this expression. Those expressions are written in the language of the system they're running in, uh, and oh, they're not okay. portable. And so, like, you can do some of it, but it ends up very quickly being tied to a specific platform. So, so just to, yeah. I know I'm interrupting, but I want to make sure I understand this. The expression language right now, it sounds like, is probably some adaptation of the SQL, whereas you're saying it still needs to be a rich policy um, based expression, which if someone were to be able to implement that independent of a SQL engine, that could be one place to locate it. Yeah, and that's exactly what OPA is trying to do. That's what okay. Bloomberg's working on. They're doing that for, um, they wrote a plugin for Trino. So Trino as a engine, like if something is being used and there's someone there to support it, we generally add support for it. So Bloomberg is using this in their environment. They use it for Trino. They use it for uh, Spark somehow. I don't know. Uh, and other things. And like that's important to them. So we have support for it. At Starburst with our like cloud hosted products, we have two products. We have an on-prem product, which is very configurable to the environments people run in. They have specific requirements. You're at a bank. You're probably using something like Ranger or Immuta. In the cloud hosted one, we have a single environment and it's very critical to our customers that like everything they're viewing, they're going through a catalog explorer. It's all viewer context aware. So it knows who I am, knows my login credentials. It knows my rules for where I logged in from. And it's applying that to everything I can see. Doing that sort of high integrated product design in a distributed system across multiple engines is very, very complex. And that's why every engine has taken the approach of, hey, we're going to have our environment and we we will do our best to make it available to things like Spark. Um, and so you see that through like things like the REST catalog interface that Tabular has popularized where it's like, you can boil these permissions down or if people stay within that box, you can absolutely run, it, you can uh, have reasonable controls for those folks using iceberg tables in Spark. You absolutely can do that. Um, but you aren't going to get to ABAC security. Okay. All right, Ryan, let's add your, let's add the iceberg perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's fair. Um, you need a, a system that can actually express policy decisions and exchange them. Uh, if you want to do anything more complex, like row level or column level security. Um, and that's that's hard to build. Um, we're building it now. Um, I don't think it's going to be, you know, as feature complete as doing it in a single engine. Um, but the flip side is that, and this is where I slightly disagree with Dan, I think we do it in the engines because that's how we've always done it. And we've never needed to share the policy because if you have one central data warehouse, you don't need any other policy or set of users or anything like that. And now that we have multiple engines accessing the same data, I think there is that necessary centralization that's pushing on this. But it's a hard problem to Dane's point. Um, and I, I fully agree with that. Um, the, the thing that I always point to is that a lot of organizations have Trino and it's set up to talk to their ranger system and go to active directory for their uh their identifications and you know things like that and then when it comes to spark it's just wide open they're like yep yeah, there's no locking that down because it accepts user code and so we'll, you know we'll just control who has access to spark and that list grows and grows and grows and they effectively don't have security and i are you I saying think this is true for open source Spark or also for Databricks? So Databricks has their own way of securing things, but there is a fundamental problem when you accept custom code 
into a, a process that like you can no longer trust that process. Um, and so most, what I'm talking about is mostly Spark um, running in areas like EMR or, you know, a, a custom cluster or in Kubernetes or, you know, many things like that. It's accepting custom code and there's, there's no good way to secure that. Um, I mean, there are, there are ways to start securing it. And I think that is the challenge that is more important than the fine grained access controls and row level policy. Now, granted, it depends on your use case. There are some people that absolutely need those fine, fine grained access controls, but I just want to stop people from leaving things wide open for Spark because, well, you know, how many, how many people do we really have using Spark? And then that blows up into the thousands. I completely agree. I, it's actually one of the reasons why I'm interested to see uh, the stuff that Bloomberg's working on with this area, because they're talking about extending OPA down to Spark, probably through a proxy of some kind. Um, it's it's an interesting world. It's also, obviously, we're looking at it. I, I work for Starburst. I definitely am looking at this problem also. Like I think it's very important uh, to be able to have a shared uh, governance system. I think we both agree. Mm -hmm. um, I think once Ryan gets to the point where they have this more stuff, they're effectively an engine at that point. But we can argue the details. I I, I think that the bigger point the 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 bigger point we actually have. So like when people are using pure iceberg, this is great, absolutely great. Like there's a well-defined interface for it. Uh, there's a well-defined way to secure your things. Like it's in iceberg. The problem is that we have customers who use Delta. We have customers who like they're migrating to iceberg. It's going to take them several years. It's a non-trivial task to do an iceberg migration. And the reason is the reason iceberg exists is because all those old tables are really hard to transform. And uh, that makes migrations difficult um, tooling can help etc but at some point like you get into a pretty big organization and they have a couple petabytes of data it's just going to take a while and it requires some sophistication to manage um, so like this is where again it's like i think we, this can be solved for a slice today like i think there is a very good slice today if you're starting greenfield absolutely just go iceberg Go simple, you know, and it's going to work out. If uh, for everyone else, like we, we live in this world where it's like we have to support everything. Okay, so explain this. And Dane, you were trying to get this across to me the other day when we were, you know, preparing. Then and and you just made this really clear. If you if it's if you go greenfield, okay, yes, it can work in iceberg. But if you have some legacy stuff. Explain these other projects that are trying to build policy that work, you know, that, that whether they're plugins or explain how a customer should think about essentially this governance, you know, where they where they have a mess of legacy stuff. Yeah. So uh, assuming you're not using Iceberg everywhere, right? Because if you are like there is security stuff built into the REST protocol. You just need a REST backend, like tabular. Um, so if you're not, then obviously go get some folks and start migrating data. Like I would definitely do that. In the meantime, like you have choices, like you can use Ranger. It's not great. The, the problem here is like everyone always tries to talk about like, oh, there's Trino and Spark and then five other things that like, yeah, some people use, but really this is a problem for Spark. Spark is very much like traditional Hadoop MapReduce in that it's not secure. As soon as you allow user code into your VM, into your same process, I would argue on the same OS, like you're not you're not really secure anymore. It's just way too easy to steal credentials directly out of memory, grab STS credentials off of the uh, the Amazon ports, um, etc. So like once you allow end user code in there, you can't trust that process. And so what you have to do at that point is you have to think about like, 
okay, I need to control this on data that's moving into that process and out of that process. And there are a handful of ways to do it. Uh, Tabular, I believe, uses uh, signed URLs for all of this today, right? Uh, we do credential vending and um, not signed URLs uh, because we can reuse them, but like a signer service, yeah. Yeah, so they, they have a, a way of doing this today um, for that. So, uh, and that works again, great for Iceberg. So like, how do other people deal with it? Uh, you build an S3 proxy, you use real S3 permissions, use something like mini IO and you control through that. Um, there are not really great solutions. Typically the solution is the data engineers who are allowed to use Spark, there's a list of them and they're literally allowed to see all data at the company, except for maybe the financials. They might put that in a different bucket and then there's a smaller group of them that do it. Uh, like this is, in my opinion, and like the other experts in our space, kind of crazy that you would give anyone access to your full data stack. Mm -hmm. And like, this is true of like, most companies they're like there are there there are companies who do do this yes so like if you're a bank if you're like bloomberg you're doing this today it is extremely expensive because you have to like manage either permissions or you have to like write a proxy for raw s3 um and that's about the only ways i need to do it I guess you could like replace a huge portion of Spark, like write a custom Spark file system or something like that. You know, I, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I would personally like extend if 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 it were easy. Like I think what should be done is like we would extend our um, existing setup to um, to Hive tables and things like that, um, and and then just like fold in that world. Um, yeah. There are challenges, especially for a startup. Um, but one thing I also want to add here is that it's not just Spark. It's Spark and any use case that doesn't go through a trusted engine. So like Trino is a trusted engine or it should be in your environment. But if you've got a Python developer running like, uh, you know, Metaflow and they want to spin up EC2 instances and go train on some data, you know, that's that's just a process going and directly accessing data. If you want, you can have that go through a database engine, but then like you're going to crush that database engine or like it's it's not cost effective. You want everyone going directly to S3 for that data and securing it, like Dane said, requires some form of S3 request signing, uh, URL signing, vended credentials, which is where I generate a temporary credential and give it back to you so that you can access it from S3 directly or a proxy. Like there are, so, there are not many ways to do this. Yeah, it, so, Amazon did not design S3 for high resolution credentials because that's hard. It's extremely hard to do at the scale they're running at. And so like most systems are just built with the idea that you have a single credential for that whole process. Um, okay. And, and so what you guys are talking about is we're st part of this separation of, I'm, I'm not sure where it's between separating storage from computer or, or compute from data, but this, this part of moving like permissions, like a really granular policy-based permissions engine needs to be some sort of shared service. Is that, is that what you're, you're saying? And that it's, it's always been associated with one compute engine and we're it's taking time to have a general purpose one that works across storage formats. I think what we're both saying is that given the diversity of software out there and the reality that you just can't trust the software because you're taking code from end users, that the only reasonable way to secure the data is to secure the the access from that process to the storage. There are a handful of ways to do it, but you need to secure in the terms of like files and directories, uh, not tables. Now, obviously we're gonna wanna map tables on top of this because you don't wanna have multiple security systems. Uh, but what we're saying is like, 
you can't do this by going and modifying all of them. There are too many of them. And it doesn't really matter because you can't put anything into that process that would be secure because they have end user code running them. Okay. All right. Um, um, let's make a, a one minute last word for each of you because we got to wind down. But obviously, this is um, a pretty rich topic, so we'll have to revisit it in the future. So, Ryan, why don't you start? Uh, I don't know that I, I have a last word. Go use Iceberg. Don't use Hive. <laughs> it's, it's so much better. <laughs> All right. That sums I, it up. I 100% agree. Go use Iceberg. Just use Trino to do it because it's awesome. <laughs> All right. On that note, we'll end uh, the first part of hopefully something we'll come back to later in the year. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.